Okay. I will start now. Oh, okay. So my name is Ranjit. I am an exam currently at UFP. I'm an exchange student uh, from India. Hi. Um, and I will be presenting some of the tools that that is currently out there. Uh, I'll be specifically focusing on text to image generation because that's what I've been working on. And uh, but there are just so you know there are other um, generative models. It's not just text to image. You can have text to text, text to video, audio, whatever. Um, yeah, let's get started. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. As I said to said before, there are a number of generating models: text to text, text to image, text to video, text to audio. Uh, you name it, anything. So video, audio, whatever. There is always there is a generating model. So uh, earlier in machine learning, um, we started with prediction um, and all those things, and then we realized that we can generate and uh, we can generate content with it uh, so we started with generation and we started with text to text and then now we can have a whole array of possibilities so i'll just quickly go through a video which kind of talks about the text to image revolution uh, that happened and uh, uh, and it later on talks about a little bit of ethical concerns that happened with it and uh, yeah so let's watch that You right to sleep. Yeah. Okay. It's Not this. Really Seven years ago, back in 2015, one major development in AI research was automated image captioning. Machine learning algorithms could already label objects and images, and now they learn to put those labels into natural language descriptions. And it made one group of researchers curious. What if you flipped that process around? We could do image to text. Why not try the text to image as well and see how it works? It was a more difficult task. They didn't want to retrieve existing images the way Google Search does. They wanted to generate entirely novel scenes that didn't happen in the real world. So they asked their computer model for something that it would have never seen before. Like all the school buses you've seen are yellow. But if you write the red or green school bus, would it actually try to generate something green? And it did that. It was a 32 by 32 tiny image. And then all you could see is like a blob of something on top of something. They tried some other props, like a herd of elephants flying in the blue skies, a vintage photo of a cat, a toilet seat sits open in the grass field, and a bowl of bananas is on the table. Maybe not something to hang on your wall, but the 2016 paper from those researchers showed the potential for what might become possible in the future. And uh, the future has arrived. It is almost impossible to overstate how far the technology has come in just one year. But Leaps and bounds. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's been quite dramatic. I, I don't know anyone who hasn't immediately been like, what? is this what is happening here mm -hmm. can i say like waves crash watching waves crashing okay <laughs> Party guy. Evil dream. a coral reef Cubism. caterpillar dancing table my prompt is salvador dali painting the skyline of new york city you may be thinking wait ai generated images aren't new you might have heard about this generated portrait going for over $400,000 at auction back in 2018, or this installation of morphing portraits, which saw to be sold the following year. It was created by Mario Klingemann, who explained to me that that type of AI art required him to collect a specific data set of images and train his own model to mimic that data. Let's say, oh, I want to create landscapes, so I collect a lot of landscape images, I want to create portraits. I trained it on portraits, but then the portrait model would not really be able to create landscapes. And same with those hyper-realistic fake faces that have been plaguing LinkedIn and Facebook. Those come from a model that only knows how to make faces. 
Generating a scene from any combination of words requires a different, newer, bigger approach. Yeah, now we kind of have these huge models, which are so huge that somebody like me actually cannot train them anymore on their own computer. But once they are there, they are really, kind of, they contain everything, I mean, to a certain extent. What this means is that we can now create images without having to actually execute them with paint or cameras or pen tools or code. The input is just a simple line of text. And I'll get to how this technology works later in the video, but to understand how we got here, we have to rewind. Uh, I just want to quickly say something. So uh, as it is said here, uh, earlier the models that we were having, uh, it was trained specifically for a certain number of uh, certain tasks. So if you have a set of dogs, it will train certain set of dogs. And that was it was trained for. But currently, the large targets model, it is like an all-in-one uh, thing. It can, no matter whatever you put in, it will give you output. Sorry. Oh, shit. AI company called OpenAI announced Dali, which they named after these guys. They said that it could create images from text captions for a wide range of concepts. And they recently announced Dolly 2, which promises more realistic results and seamless output. But they haven't released either version to the public. So over the past year, a community of independent open source developers built text to image generators out of other pre-trained models that they did have access to. And you can play with those online for free. Some of those developers are now working for a company called Midjourney which created a Discord community with bots that turn your text into images in less than a minute. Having basically no barrier to entry to this has made it like a whole new ball game. Been up until like two or three in the morning, just, you know, really trying to change things and piece things together and done about 7,000 images. It's just ridiculous. Midjourney currently has a wait list for subscriptions, but we got a chance to try it out. Oh, wow, that is so cool. Yes, he has some more to do. I, I, I feel like it, it, it can be, it's not dancing and it could be better. The craft of communicating with these deep learning models has been dubbed prompt engineering. What I love about prompting, for me, it's kind of really, it, it has something like magic where you have to know the right words for the, for the spell. You realize that you can, uh, refine the way you talk to the machine it becomes like kind of a dialogue you can say like octane render blender 3d made with unreal engine certain types of film lenses and cameras 1950s 1960s thanks thanks are really good lino cuts or wood cut coming up with funny pairings like faberge egg mcmuffins a monochromatic infographic poster about typography depicting chinese characters some of the most striking images can come from prompting the model to synthesize a long list of concepts. It's kind of like a, having a very strange collaborator that bounce ideas off of and gives unpredictable ideas back. New Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola. Born for what's next. Born for a bolder taste. Born for shaking things up. The taste of a perfect match. Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola, born for this. I love that. My prompt was Chasing Seafoam Dreams, which is a lyric from the Ted Leo and the Pharmacist song by Musicology. And I use it as the album cover for my first album. All right. For an image generator to be able to respond to so many different prompts, it needs a massive, diverse training data set like hundreds of millions of images scraped from the internet along with their text descriptions. Those captions come from things like the alt text that website owners upload with their images for accessibility and for search engines. So that's how engineers get these giant data sets. But then what do the models actually do with them? We might assume that when we give them a text prompt, like a banana inside a snow globe from 1960, they search through the training data to find related images and then copy over some of those pixels. But that's not what's happening. The new generated image doesn't come from the training data. It comes from the latent space of the deep learning model. That will make sense in a minute. First, let's look at how the model learns. If I gave you these images and told you to match them to these captions, you'd have no problem. But what about now? This is what images look like to a machine, just pixel values for red, green, and blue. 
you just have to make a guess. And that's what the computer does too at first. But then you could go through thousands of rounds of this and never figure out how to get better at it. Whereas a computer can eventually figure out a method that works. That's what deep learning does. In order to understand that this arrangement of pixels is a banana and this arrangement of pixels is a balloon, it looks for metrics that help separate these images in mathematical space. So how about color? If we measure the amount of yellow in the image, that would put the banana over here and the balloon over here in this one dimensional space. But then what if we run into this? Now our yellowness metric isn't very good at separating bananas from balloons. We need a different variable. So let's add an axis for roundness. Now we've got a two dimensional space with the round balloons up here and the banana down here. But if we look at more data, we may come across a banana that's pretty round and a balloon that isn't. So maybe there's some way to measure shininess. Balloons usually have a shiny spot. Now we have a three-dimensional space. And ideally, when we get a new image, we can measure those three variables and see whether it falls in the banana region or the balloon region of the space. But what if we want our model to recognize not just bananas and balloons, but all these other things, yellowness, roundness, and shininess don't capture what's distinct about these objects. We need better variables, and we need a lot more of them. That's what deep learning algorithms do as they go through all the training data. They find variables that help improve their performance on the task, and in the process, they build out a mathematical space with way more than three dimensions. We are incapable of picturing multidimensional space, but Midjourney's model offered this, and I like it. So we'll say this represents the latent space of the model, and it has more than 500 dimensions. Those 500 axes represent variables that humans wouldn't even recognize or have names for, but the result is that the space has meaningful clusters, a region that captures the essence of banananess, a region that represents the textures and colors of photos from the 1960s, an area for snow and an area for globes and snow globes somewhere in between. Any point in this space can be thought of as the recipe for a possible image, and the text prompt is what navigates us to that location. But then there's one more step, translating a point in that mathematical space into an actual image in pixel space involves a generative process called diffusion. It starts with just noise and then over a series of iterations arranges pixels into a composition that makes sense to humans. Because of some randomness in the process, it will never return exactly the same image for the same prompt. And if you enter the prompt into a different model designed by different people and trained on different data, you'll get a different result because you're in a different latent space. Data management can be costly and complicated. So we built Slingshot to help Snowflake users manage costs, speed adoption, and automate governance in the cloud. Now, Capital One Software is offering Slingshot to other companies. That's technology at Capital One. No way! That is so cool! What the heck? The like brush strokes, the color palette, that's fascinating. I wish I could like, I mean he's dead, but like go up to me like look what I <laughs> Oh, that's pretty cool. Probably the only dolly that I could afford in my place. <laughs> The ability of deep learning to extract patterns from data means that you can copy an artist's style without copying their images, just by putting their name in the prompt. James Gurney is an American illustrator who quickly became a popular reference for users of text-to-image models. I asked him what kind of norms he would like to see as prompting becomes widespread. I think it's only fair to people looking at this work that they should know what the prompt was and also what software was used. Also, I think the artists should be allowed to opt in or opt out of having their work that they worked so hard on by hand be used as a data set for creating this other artwork. James Gurney, I think he was a great example of being someone who was open to it, started talking with their artists, but I also heard an audit artist who got actually extremely upset. The copyright questions regarding the images that go into training the models and the images that come out of them are completely unresolved. And those aren't the only questions that this technology will provoke. The latent space of these models contains some dark corners that get scarier as outputs become photorealistic. It also holds an untold number of associations that we wouldn't teach our children, but that it learned from the internet. 
if you ask for an image of the videos, like an old white guy, if you ask for images of nurses, they're all like women. We don't know exactly what's in the data sets used by OpenAI or MidJourney, but we know the internet is biased for the English language and Western concepts with whole cultures not represented at all. In one open source data set, the word Asian is represented first and foremost by an avalanche of porn. Yeah, it really is just sort of a infinitely complex mirror, you know, hold up to our society and what we deem worthy enough to, you know, put on the internet in the first place and how we think about what we do put up. But what makes this technology so unique is that it enables any of us to direct the machine to imagine what we want it to see. Uh, party hat guy, space invader, a caterpillar, and a round and roll. Prompting removes the obstacles between our ideas and images, and eventually videos, animations, and whole virtual worlds. We are on a voyage here that is, um, it's a bigger deal than, than just like one decade or the immediate technical consequences. It's a change in the way humans imagine, communicate, work with their own culture. And that will have long range good and bad consequences that we, we are just by definition not going to be capable of completely anticipating. Over the course of researching this video, I spoke to a bunch of creative people who have played with these tools, and I asked them what they think this all means for people who make a living making. Okay, so um, for the next few minutes, I'll I'll just quickly uh, go through some of the uh, AI tools that uh, we generally use in our uh, lab. And you can try them out using uh, a space called Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is a company that specializes in developing artificial intelligence tools. They are uh, many, uh, there are many uh, tools like NLP toolkits and all are famous from them. Uh, they also have a space where you can put out uh, your um, what I have created. Let's say I have created an AI tool. I can put it out uh, in the space uh, after it is trained so that people like you can use it and you know explore. So that is what I'll do. So the first the first machine that uh so first tool that I'll be using is uh stable diffusion. Stable diffusion is one of the most popular um uh, text to image generation model that is out there. So the image that you see in here. So the the prompt that I gave was Neanderthal uh, taking selfies, uh, and this is what they gave me. Um, pretty cool. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and uh, the prompt that I gave was uh, of a dog team playing football, a uh, soccer. Uh, so this is what it gave me. So I think it's pretty nice. So so as I said, stable diffusion is a text to image generation model. So. A stable diffusion, uh, when you hear the word, we hear the word diffusion. And I'm pretty sure as a high school student, you must have learned about diffusion process. If anybody can chip in and say what is diffusion, that would be. Anybody? No? Yeah, in general. Exactly. Uh, so it's like uh, it, it's like a, a spreading of things um, from a concentrated space to a less concentrated space. So stable diffusion started with that idea. So in stable diffusion, how it works is that so we have a noise to begin with, and we slowly refine it. We slowly spread it to get to a certain image which the text represents. So the architecture and out office is maybe not uh, relevant to you guys, but the whole idea is that it slowly refines a noisy text into a particular image that we are looking for. So that is basically how stable diffusion uh, works in a very, very high overview. Uh, so it has been trained by billions of images. So it is pretty nice. So there is a hugging face demo for it. So if you will, all if you can all go through this go to this link and maybe try it out so i have a 
kind of a small challenge for you guys. Uh, I want you to get creative and try to give me the most creative output that you can put out in stable diffusion from a stable diffusion model. And the best gets the price of X2 page champion. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hope you are able to get into this one. Oh, okay, so I hope you're able to go to the link. I'll, I'll also go. I'll put some time. Mega, suggest me a prom. Dino mm -hmm. Colada, okay. Dino Colada. Elephant on a beach, chilling with grown up women. Chilling with? Grown up women. Grown up what? Grown up minions. Minions. Okay. Oh. Who be seen? Let's see. Okay. Is this lower than No, it's usually this thing. Ah, okay. Anyone got It, it takes a little while because it's a it's a very well known tool. What's this? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why did you choose? Is this grown up minions? Why did you choose the elephants? Elephants, because there is a elephants on a beach. Huh? Elephants on a beach with grown-up minions. Oh, okay. <laughs> the prompt is that.
Anybody else in this particular school? Two ways? <laughs> okay, I wait like ten more seconds and then move on. I just wanted to see this. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess we will move on. But I like the apocalypse one, <laughs> which is really cool. <laughs> you can, uh, but anyway, the point is you can try out on your own and uh, you can see how how it works, where it fails, you know. So I can maybe try something which might, which might fail. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I can hold it in the side room and all um, the village looks after the blood or everything has lit. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. I just want to go to one more thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you want to talk about that? No, it's fine. You can call it to you and keep it really yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay, this takes a lot of time. Okay. We need ten more seconds. Then it will work. It, it doesn't. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. I wanted to go to control that based on that interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the prompt that I gave was Obama dabbing. Um, it didn't understand what is dabbing. 
So I guess it was not able, it, it could create Obama, but then I, I don't see that in this. So like what, what could make it better? So one thing that could make it better was a image reference that you could give it to it and be like, oh, this is what dabbing looks like. And maybe then train the model. So that is something. Well, this is not the best, but uh, that is what control net um, and other architecture of text image generation does. So think of control net as two parts. There is a stable diffusion, which does text to image modeling, which works in whatever I said, diffusion process, uh, creates start from a start from a noisy image and gets to the um, gets to the image that you want based on the text input that you give. And then there is an another architecture which takes in this. Um, so I gave I gave a, a image reference of somebody dabbing. So I gave it. Uh, give that and I said that oh yeah this is the image that is known as David and th there is another model which trains on it it trains specifically on the image that is given to it and then we combine the, both the things and we get an output which is better I get it that the Obama may not be the best but uh, that is because I gave a maybe a mm, stupid prompt but if you gave a better prompt I'm pretty sure it will give you Obama David so yeah so you can go to control net as well and you can uh, check on it uh, if you want uh, or else we can move into the next it's basically the same thing uh, the only difference is you can there is an option for you to upload an image and then you can you know generate image based on it but since it will take a little bit more time i think i'll skip that okay and I'll um, go to a project that I I am working on since I, as I told I am an exchange student so I am working on a project under here so I am working on food because why not I love food uh, so um, the project that I am working on is ingredient detection and basically identification and later on use it for um, anything health issues let's say I have uh, I have diabetes and I have to use foods that is specific to me and things like that. So I work on, um, uh, I work on food. So the project that I was doing is food ingredient detection and identification. So in that, I generated a whole set of images using stable diffusion, giving prompts, just the recipes. Uh, let's say I want to make um, chicken sandwich. I just gave chicken sandwich and it generated a very good, as you can see, all these images, everything is generated by stable diffusion. None of it's from internet, uh, scroll, uh, you know, web crawled, nothing. I've cre I created everything from stable diffusion. And then I've later on used another models which can identify the locate the objects. So one interesting thing that you can notice is that usually in, in a um, object detection model, you can only detect objects which are there, uh, which you can see, right? Uh, like, for example, um, this is peanuts, so I can detect peanuts. Uh, this is a cake, so cake. But it also detected that sugar is in this, or egg is in this. But you cannot see egg in that, or let's say peanuts, so salt is in this. So that is that is something that I've been working on which is detecting invisible ingredients by invisible I meant, which may not be uh, visible to the naked eye or some, uh, I, I'm also working on image ingredients, which are a little bit deformed uh, by deformed. I meant like tomato, for example, tomato has in different ingredients is different. It's, it's a, it may be a paste in one ingredient or diced in one ingredient or one recipe. So depending on that, uh, you know, the shape of the ingredients changes or based on cooking actions, if it is grilled, if it is fried, it is different. And these are very important because um, grilled may produce a certain number of, a certain amount of um, uh, nutrition as compared to uh, fried. And maybe fried may not be best for you, but grilled is. Uh, do you have something? Uh, 
Excellent question. So that is something I also had the uh, issue with. So what if this does not have eggs? So you may not know it. So currently we are not, we have not re reached that stage because this, how it works is that it kind of predicts like whether a cake is, um, when there is a cake, there is a very high probability that egg may be present or sugar uh, or sugar may be present. Uh, but yeah, there are exceptions that, you know, there is eggless cakes. That, that is something that we are working on in our next project that we can, how we are able to detect certain number of things. But as of now, we have reached a point where we are able to, you know, detect invisible increase. But excellent question. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so what was I talking about? Um, so yeah, this is, this is what um, I've been working on. And I have also, uh, wanted to talk about a uh, tree. Uh, don't um, uh, don't get uh, confused by anything. So basically, what I I was doing is I created a tree where in which uh, I can, if I am not able to detect a certain thing, I can go a step above and detect something else. Let's say if I'm if there is an image of a salmon uh, cooked and I'm not able to detect that. So I can go one step above and say it is at least a meat. So, you know, take care of this um, or do certain things. At the end of the day, the whole idea is to use this for um, health purposes or personalized uh, recipe uh, choices or things like that. The We want to have a personalized uh, nutrition um, management app or something like that. That's the end goal of it. And uh, these are steps that we are taking towards this. We are taking consideration of cooking actions. We are taking consideration of um, in uh, the the particular uh, ingredients that are present. Whether it's seen, we are taking different um, entities like just not just the images, but also the text and things like that. So yeah, this is basically the project that I've been working on, and that's it from my end. Um, for yeah, I can just all right so she will continue the later on part and if you have any doubts let me so now that we saw <clears throat> in the first session and what with what Ranjit presented we saw how uh, we can generate AI content but at the same time we saw that we don't always want I mean generating content from AI may not always be a good thing we have seen examples of where we can, uh, you know, give some fake news and it will generate an image supporting the fake news with the example that I showed or that I'm about to show. Uh, anyway, so the thing is now we want to talk about uh, detection. So I'd like to call Janendra who will talk about image detection. I think I'm talking about it, but uh, uh, this is an open prop. This is not something solved. This is not something like uh, we know how to do it. So it's a billion dollar question. Right now, we are generated image detection that uh, I think uh, we should talk about. So let's say I have a group of 15 uh, highly professional high school students. And how can I approach this problem? AI generated image detection. We saw a long lecture on how to, how to generate it and how we get beautiful images by just using some prompts seems very easy some engineers worked on it and they found a way to do it now let's say i have a group of 15 engineers how to solve this problem i'm open to questions like just being strong on it we have been saying ai for a very long time so let's just take inputs now 
Okay. Yeah. So, so let's say uh, we are there by rules and say we have watermark on all the images. So some company comes who are not doing legal work and they are uh, making this high resolution image but not putting watermark on it. How do we detect it? It's still a problem, right? Even so, we put watermark regulation on. Regulation are not uh, followed by everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another point on that, I think. Just like how you have been with for the whole year of license yeah. of the image tools, there are uh, there are AI tools which are most yeah. important. Yeah. So all these points are related to regulation, right? Let's say we have already limited AI images, probably thousands uh comes right now available. Some of them are so astonishingly good that I cannot compare if the video has been limited or not. So how to deal with that? And I I I want you to keep thinking whether uh, I I'll go forward in my presentation, but I want all of you guys to keep thinking about that. How do we do that? So as as been talking about AI generated images can be used to create false or misleading content that we have already seen, like Trump being arrested, Putin being arrested, and uh, Pope Francis uh, in a in a fashionable way going out somewhere. So all this we have seen. And what are the ethical and legal concerns that comes with it? Uh, you can say AI generated images can be used to infringe on people's privacy, such as by creating fake images of individuals that can be used for har harassment or extortion. Uh, the use of AI generated images raises eagle and ethical questions such as who owns the copyright of generated images? Who is responsible for any harm caused by the use of these images? These are all the concerns. And uh, what if uh, the data is sensitive, like uh, healthcare data, or and let's say we generate also to say that uh, oh, this can be used in certain contexts in healthcare, or 
or criminal justice, but how reliable are they? These are the some examples from Midgen. Uh, these are photo photorealistic images. Can you uh, say that these are not AI generated? Does it look like it's not AI generated? Uh -huh. But, but the AI still in right three out of three. Yeah. Yeah. Also, oh. also, if you notice the man in the background, the man, his, his face looks very chiseled to be a human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this this is something that we have observed with images generated by these AI models is that things in the background don't have as much detail as the main object that is in front of. So that is one clear indication. If you have a better background, it's not it's going to show up it's with a lot of anomalies, and that that is an easy place. But otherwise, it's quite. Yeah. So let's say we found out some of the anomalies that is present in the in such photographs. How do you explain your computer that? These are the anomalies now. How do you explain it to your computer saying that look out for these things? Even though in most uh, uh, nice images that you click from your camera still have certain kind of distortion, it may say like, oh, this is AI generated, but it could be a real photo. So how do you say that? Can you add on the, um, I'm just going to call this, uh, mm -hmm. On the part of the the Yeah. I think for the rest of the you have to up that So, in the higher like reality, you have to have to have to have to have to Okay, now we have a threshold space of 0 to 200. How do you find what's the threshold? So, what's the Yeah. Yeah, that's a research problem, right? You have to try error, this kind of thing. That's where machine learning and deep learning comes up. So, you give a lot of examples to such or such images and you come up with uh, this theoretical values. So what suits better for the task? Yeah. 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 So you see, this is an open-ended question and this is, uh, it's not like uh, you cannot approve this problem. This is how every engineer starts. This is how every research question being asked how to do it once you've seen it and this i i'm very sure that uh, uh, with the amount of knowledge you can consume you still seem to be coming to same questions and same starting point because a lot of uh, 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 research is going on you can still read that but you'll have ended up in the same question that you'll find you'll find yourself questioning also And what's like, uh, why is it more being a problem right now? Because of accessibility, like we just use stable diffusion models and anybody can use it. Anybody can spread this misinformation in a way uh, you would, you guys won't want to. So this is, these are two examples, which are free right now that you can use anytime. So this was my question. We are back to the question again. Do we have more ideas on how to generate, how to detect it? I have a very, uh, I have a way, but it's like not a, not a research uh, perspective way that everybody should do it on that way. But yeah. Yeah. So you mean like train a machine learning model to find a difference as we have a user 
There is a there is some models which does that. Uh, uh, you are talking about a more uh, AI model which can detect uh, take the train AI model which detects. Right? So based on these concepts, there have been some models which have been done. And I'll show you my uh, that's a, that's a nice point. He's talking about metadata that comes different images, right? So who, who took this image and who, uh, what date it is in, what the height, what the weight, what, what all that, right? That's but that can be generated too, right? We have like generation model too. Yeah. <laughs> Taking old person right now, so it's like that could be achievable, but uh, that that could be a suitable solution. I don't know. That that's also a research-ended question. Yeah. What else do we have more? Could a machine learning model be used to detect AI generated R? Yeah, that's a question, right? So I tried out something that I would like to show you guys. So I went to Reddit and I say. Uh, these are the subreddits of traditional uh, R, like R slash art, R slash painting, and R, R slash learn to draw, which does not use all of these uh, fancy models. And I create and I taken took images which were before this a AI evolution came, and we have models accessible. And uh, we have this uh, subreddit which. Uh, uh, used to generate AI images. Now we had two sets of images, right? Once we, uh, one which are uh, AI generated and one which are not. So we can run a classifier, like he said, that's what everybody does right now. That's the starting point for everyone saying that we, oh, let's train our model to find this distinction, right? So, uh, when is it, uh, we were actively working on problems whenever we get a problem statement like, um, okay, how do I see whether it's human or AI? The first thing that comes to mind is, okay, I will have a human content data set, I will have an AI content data set, I will put it on a machine learning model and train it to classify what is human and AI. Everybody starts there. Yeah. And the first model is a simple classifier, which is based on a simple ML uh, model. Yeah, it's it's not like it's pretty hefty stuff and nobody can do it. Anybody could start, anybody could do it. Like you don't need to write code also. You can go to hugging face, fine tune your model there and try to try to do what what it looks like. So this is what it's being done. So yeah, so just to be sure, I gathered the human category before 2019. So to find the model also, there is a model called AutoTrain where you give your data set and it uh, it uh, searches in the whole data set of uh, Hugging Face saying that this model would be more suitable for your data. Use this model by training it on a small uh, subset of the data. So we got a winner after that. Uh, our winner was a screen transformer. This was some model available in the hugging space and this is what the accuracy looked like do do you think this would be these are my research and i have solved the billion dollar question of ai generated images even though the accuracy looks great we i got 94 percent accuracy yeah uh, you, 
yeah, you're talking about the size and imbalance of the data set, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that things are still there. Yeah, so that that's what my point was. I trained it on six thousand examples, and for those six thousand examples, this was the this was a good accuracy. Let's say if we have more of this data, maybe we will be able to solve uh, our accuracy will decrease we when we try to increase our data in on internet scale. So this this still remains a problem. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, before you go, um, I just wanted to say that this is this is an open-ended question. Maybe you should try to find out something. Maybe you should try to uh, research on it. This is what I wanted to give you guys as a problem, maybe to 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 do research on. It. Yeah, because so it's still an open-ended question. Yeah, this is just. Yeah. Yes. yeah yeah this is a this is this may be someone's phd topic it's as of topic. now yeah. yeah that's us maybe <laughs> okay yeah. thank you are there any questions yeah we are 